Hi, everyone. The, the, the Dutch people are, um, it seems, on average, the tallest people in the world. So there's a lot of tall people. I'm, I'm pretty okay in the Netherlands, but once you go outside, you, um, yeah, well, you notice that you're fairly tall. Um, Dimitri was also very tall, so that was good. Hi, everyone. Um, glad you could all make it. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Um, it's my uh, third time in St. Petersburg and also on this conference. And I have a story for you on um, health and health checking monitoring with ASP.NET and .NET Core. Um, a lot to cover, so let's get started quickly. Uh, in, in the audience, um, who of you is building cloud-based solutions or maybe just solutions that consist of a lot of individual components, like a large distributed system? Okay, so that's about a quarter of the room. Um, once you start doing it, or if you're about to, to go there, if you have a distributed system, your system start, uh, consists of many parts, and it suddenly becomes a challenge to keep track of your system, and if it's running, and if it's running okay. Because sometimes in those systems, if one thing fails, another thing starts failing, and everything, and it just collides. And especially if your system consists of not just one or two or ten components, but maybe thousands of services, microservices, and they all interact together and they need each other. So it becomes important to know the state of your system. And if the system is not doing very well, then, then you should intervene somehow. So if you're doing DevOps and as a developer, you're also doing the operation side, you don't want to be surprised when your system starts collapsing and you didn't notice it until it became like this, this very big problem. And if you, if you um, need to know what you, how your system is doing, you would like to know that of each and every part of your system. How is it doing um, and is something happening? So the, the, the challenge and also for this session is how would you know the health status of the individual services, the individual components in your system? Now, traditionally, um, this, this, is, this has long been a problem in, uh, in, in big systems. Normally, what you would do is you would collect performance and health data through things like events, metric, um, telemetry and logs and traces, and you gather them in a centralized place. So you get them from all the machines, um, and there's, there's a whole bunch. I just picked a, a few of the more popular ones. APM tooling, so that's application performance monitoring, and there's a whole lot of them that solve that problem. They, they receive all these metrics and data, and they offer it to you, and you can do stuff. You can query it, and you can inspect your system. That approach is something like this. It's, it's like in traditional medicine and health. What would you normally do? Um, normally, you would go to see your doctor, and you would ask, doctor, am I sick? Because maybe, you know, I, I might be sick. And the doctor might reply, okay, um, we took some measurements before. Um, you have a certain pulse, 60, and a blood pressure, 130 over 80. You know, if, we, if, if I do the math, then you seem to be healthy. So you're doing okay. And you would say, cool, I'm, I'm healthy. So that's you as one component asking something else if you're healthy. And the doctor would know that now. Um, alternatively, it could be I'm, I'm 180 in my pulse, so a very high pulse, a higher blood pressure, and the doctor would say, That's, that doesn't look good, so you might be sick. And you would say thanks or no thanks, um, because you know, that you need, something needs to be done. And usually the doctor intervenes and gives you medicine or you know, um, the, 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 the metaphor uh, doesn't really work well, because in, in systems you might restart the system, but I don't know how that will work for humans. Um, but this is, this is how it was done, and this is uh, the telemetry and the, uh, the metrics that you, you send them to someone and he makes a decision. And that's, that's, that's sort of challenging because the information that you need to give is usually generic. You don't want to give very specific information because um, every part of the system would have other types of data that might be relevant, so getting that in a centralized place would just explode the number of data and the pieces of data there. Um, what would you do if there were no measurements coming in? Does that mean that all of your system is uh, not doing well? Um, and it's also about uh, if you want to make educated decisions on the health, 
you need to know something of the internals, of the inside of the person. You can't just look on the outside based on polls um, and decide if, if that's um, an indication that you're being healthy. And the other thing is, if you want to make those decisions, what if you want to make them from multiple places and just decide based on those metrics um, how you're doing? So it would scatter the logic on the outside on multiple places on making decisions about your health. So let's move forward to the approach with the health monitoring as it's now being used. So um, that might be more modern. Um, and the other thing, the, this would be that the doctor would ask you, how are you doing today? And you would say, okay, I have a pulse of 180 and a blood pressure of 110. Um, and you could make the decision that you say, oh, okay, I, I might not be healthy because that, that's pretty high. But it could also mean that you say, it's totally okay, I know I'm working out, I'm, I'm doing a run or something, um, so I can expect a high pulse and a blood pressure, that's totally okay. And I know that my back doesn't hurt, so that's usually an indication that I'm, I'm getting sick, this is all okay. And that's like a totally different outcome that would be really hard for a doctor to make if he doesn't know, you know, um, if, if, if you, you can decide yourself best when you're healthy and when you're not, because you know what are the signs of unhealthiness. Um, you can also feel inside and you can't just tell the doctor everything, but also the doctor could ask all of his patients, how are you doing, how are you doing? And they would all know how to, to tell if they're being healthy or not. Does this make sense? So the big switch is you're being asked to do a self-assessment, you assess your health yourself and you can use all the knowledge that you have to make that decision. And that, that comes back to the, the, the difference between metrics. Metrics are just time-based series that just stream out and it's uh, a lot of data, uh, very useful for uh, performance measurements and debugging scenarios or troubleshooting. Um, but as I said, the logic to make decisions needs to be on the outside. So the decision from your application that sends data, metrics, to some monitoring tool, um, the monitoring tool makes the decision. And it needs to know a lot of things. Um, alternatively, if you do the health approach, um, because you know um, what defines whether you're healthy, it could be that you're using uh, a queue uh, where you pick up messages, and you know that if the number of messages in the queue go over 100, you're struggling, you can't keep up with the pace of the messages. So you might say, I'm not healthy because I can't keep up with all those messages. That could be an indication that you yourself make as a, a part of the system as a service. So your app is being asked, how are you doing? Um, and then you would say, yes, I'm, I'm doing fine or I'm not doing fine. And that's the reverse order of things. And it's really useful if you're doing the DevOps thing because um, when you build your uh, implementation, you also build all those health logic inside. And you ship that as part of your code, um, and it's there, and you, all, all that's being done is they ask you your health. And you don't have to deploy your implementation and go to this other team and say, okay, you need to change your queries on the metrics because now you need to look differently at how, when I'm healthy and when I'm not. And it creates dependencies, and by doing the health stuff, you just, um, are more in control and you are autonomous in your deployments. Okay, several levels of health. It, it starts with the simple stuff and it's are you available at all? So if, if you offer an endpoint as a, as, a, as a service, they can query you at this well-known endpoint. It's usually something like your address slash health. If, they get a, if, you, if the, the one asking you are you healthy Puts, do, does a GET request on the endpoint, um, a response usually means, okay, we know you're there, so you're available. Um, and the status code might indicate 200 is being okay, and 503 is unavailable, or 500 error is just, in, in general, it's unhealthy. Um, another thing is the latency might be an indication. So if you ask, are you healthy, and it takes w very long, it, it might also be um, an indication that you're not doing well. Um, and you could check all the internal stuff. Um, so that's, that's the simple stuff. Then after that, you might step up the, um, 
the, the health check and do more elaborate health checks, and you could go for external dependencies, because usually your service depends on a database, depends on a queue, depends on a content delivery network outside. Um, it can depend on a lot of things, like storage for blobs. If they are there, um, then you can, you can access them, um, and that that's, uh, means that you could be healthy as well, because if your database is down, you can't function. So you need to indicate that, that I'm not doing well because of. Another thing that we'll talk about a bit later is the readiness and the liveliness. That's when we, we start talking about clusters. Um, readiness and liveliness helps a cluster orchestrator to know are you ready to start receiving input and are you lively enough so you can stay around or should I recycle you because you're not doing very well, you're not lively anymore. And then after the advanced stuff, you might go into predictive stuff. Um, predicting maybe it will go wrong in the future. And, and you can do all sorts of analysis. It might be something like um, you have a certificate for business to business communication to an external party. And you know that the certificate is going to expire in a few days. So you might already start indicating it's going to go wrong in two days. Um, so now we, we know that it's um, going wrong, or it might be a trend in memory consumption, and the memory consumption might go up, and before it reaches the level where you would say, um, I'm, I'm consuming too much memory, you can already see, okay, it's going there, so I'm not being really healthy anymore. Okay. Now, you might expect that there's, the, the, the two states are obvious, you're healthy or you're unhealthy. Um, usually they take the 200 OK code as um, an indication that everything is fine. Unhealthy means um, 503, service unavailable, and you're not able to perform. But there's something in between, and that's the degraded. That's the, um, I'm not doing as well I, as I could. So I can be better, and maybe I need to recycle. Um, now, let's, let's step to .NET Core 2.2. In .NET Core 2.2, they introduced this, this health check um, for the diagnostics, and it consists of three NuGet packages. Um, you have the health checks with all the implementation, you have abstractions, and abstractions are all the interfaces and the generic stuff, and you have the entity framework, which is um, a single health check related to DB context. Now, you don't have to use ASP.NET Core for this, you could, but you don't have to. Um, but ASP.NET Core can be used because it's really good for offering the health endpoints. But all the check-in can be done internally. Um, all you need to do is find a way to push it out or get it out, and the ASP.NET Core middleware that you get will help you get is this public endpoint. So this is how you would bootstrap it. And I've taken ASP.NET Core as an example because it, it has all the moving parts. So your ASP.NET Core application, you have this endpoint, the, the, a, a versioned API endpoint, you have your implementation in the large blue bucket, and your middleware that takes care of all the routing. Now this is, this is where you start. And then you um, call this method, add health checks on your services collection, and the, the, um, the services will get a new registration for the default health check service. And that's the moving part of your health checks. So that will be injected into the system um, and available to be used. And for ASP.NET Core, you would do some middleware routing. And the middleware routing, um, you specify an endpoint, like I said, slash health is where you usually start, and it just puts it into the middleware and loops it or forwards it to the default health check service. So all of a sudden, you have an endpoint that you can query with a get, and it will give you back some, some information. This is how you get started. Now, the next thing is, okay, wh wh what, what, what's gonna happen now? So we have this service, and the service is gonna do something. Um, well, it uses implementations of iHealthCheck. And the iHealthCheck impl uh, implementation that you need to build or need to use is um, check health async. So it's an asynchronous method because a health check can take a while, and you will, um, um, it will give back a health check result, and the health check result is they're healthy 
unhealthy or degraded in the middle. And it will do so on demand from your endpoints. Um, so whenever you call the endpoint, it will give back the results. Um, but it could also do it periodically with publishers, and that's pushing it out. We'll talk about that later. So it's either calling or pushing it out. That's when it happens. And how it happens is you register one or more of those health checks, and um, um, it will just loop over all of the health checks, firing each of the health checks, and seeing what their result is. Um, what is the total health uh, result? Well, the total health result, this is from the source code on GitHub for this part. So whenever one of the health checks says failed, they say it's game over, man. Um, um, so failed, one failing health check means the entire service is considered unhealthy. If you want that to be different, you could do a different implementation because you don't have to use the default health check service. You could do that differently. But this is usually good enough. If one thing fails, you, um, everyone fails. There is something to, um, to, to consider. Um, if your, health, uh, your, your service is unhealthy, how can you trust it anymore? So it's sort of a, the, a moral question. If, if you say you're not doing well, I might not trust you and I might have to take um, precautions anyway. Okay, so um, final thing before we go into a demo. Um, the, in, um, the iterating over all of those health checks, this is what happens if you start registering actual health checks. So you do add health checks, um, you do the, the middleware, and then you start adding more and more checks. So you can do an add check, you give it a name, so that's a name that you can see in, in the output, for example, and you can do that by um, just providing a delegate that evaluates something. You can do it asynchronously, so an async check will give an async delegate and it will check something. And you could do um, typed uh, checks, where you just have this generic, where you pass in the generic health check type, and that's a, let's call it a strong typed health check, or just one that's built, an implementation of I health check. Um, and you can have multiple, um, and this will be your set of uh, health checks. Now, when there's a get on the endpoint, the internals will start building a health report. And initially, they assume that everything is fine. And then they will call each of your um, health checks individually. So there's the, um, the first one that will be called, and it creates a health check result in the report. And it's, uh, it's like an in-memory object, right? It's not a real report that you would print out. Um, so the async, that works well, and something like this could happen. You try to access the database, but it's taking too long. So you, okay, that health check gave back an un, uh, a degraded. So the report starts to fall into degraded as well. Then you check your external dependency, might be another web API, and it doesn't return anything at all. Um, this is where you need to be wary of timeouts, by the way. Because if you call into this and you need to wait for 10 or 15 seconds, you have a very long health check. But if this happens, the, the report gets another entry for unhealthy. This is where we go into the game over. So the health report is unhealthy. And we give back a 500 with the details, um, as much details as you think is suitable. So this is the internals of what is going to happen there. Now let's see a bit of code. What I have here is um, a um, web API, which is just boilerplate. I didn't put too much in, and the source code is available on GitHub, by the way, and it's uh, in the link at the end of the slides. Um, it has a lot of uh, custom health checks in here for demo purposes, um, but in the end, it's just uh, this, this single controller that will start calling, and it has a program, CS. Um, it does the usual stuff and it adds some application insights, that's for later. Um, and we have a startup. And the startup, it goes through um, this bit here. So we have services, add health checks, in, um, that uh, registers the default health check service in the dependency injection system. We'll talk about these publishers later, but then there's four health checks here. Um, that's one part of what we need to do. Um, there's a lot more that we'll talk about later. And then finally, in the configuration here, 
we start adding these health check endpoints. So this one is the, the ping. That's a simple one. So it has a, um, it doesn't run any of the health checks. So it has a predicate to filter it, and it just says no, no, don't use any of the of the registered health checks because this is just an endpoint to ping. And if it says okay, then it's good. If it doesn't respond, you know, it's there's something wrong anyway. But it's a very uh, fast and low level thing uh, to do. The other one is that you can you can use uh, some options, and and I'll discuss them in the slides. But it's it's way to tweak how the endpoint behaves, and you pass in those options here, um, and you can add more health endpoints. So that's that's another thing. You don't have to have just one; you can have more. And I've already um, included some other ones for later when we do the clustering stuff. Um, if we run this. Now, this is the tricky part because um, this is where things are supposed to go wrong because some things need to be unhealthy. Um, but let's see if the, everything spins up. I'm actually running this. So the, the starter project, while this spins up, is a Docker Compose project. So I'm using Docker Compose. And I'm, this, is, this is where I spin up the, uh, the web API as a Docker image. So this, this will work in a cluster as well. But you don't have to use Docker for this, obviously. You can just uh, host it any way you want. Now let's see. So it's already um, uh, spun up. It has um, this, um, this response for a get operation. You know the values controller that's usually there. Um, and if we go to the, well, let's go to the ping first. And the ping says healthy. So it, it gives an answer, it gives back a payload, and it's a 200 OK message. Um, we can go to health. And the health gives back a lot more information. That's actually because the, the way the output is written is, has been changed by the options. There's a response writer in there, and the response writer says, make just a dump of uh, most of the contents of the health report. So this is what was in, inside of the health report. Each of the health checks that are there, um, they, they give back uh, a duration of how long it took and the individual status. So the overall status was healthy. That's this one. That's the top of the report. And then each of the health checks indicates some details that, is, uh, that, that are available. So this is what you get from there. For development purposes, um, it might be nice to have a health check UI. And this is also what you can get. So we'll talk about how you, how you can choose this. But in, this is um, a nice way for development per, uh, uh, while you're developing to see how your um, API is doing or the thing you're building. And we could actually trigger it to do, um, let's see. And we'll go to API buggy slash one. So uh, in the code, um, this actually triggers the trip wire health check to go into a bad state. So it goes to, uh, it returns a one. The one is the enumeration value for degraded. So the middle one, the orange one. And you see that already. Um, it, it also tripped the, the circuit breaker and it tripped the, um, the trip wire because we did that. And if, if I'm fast, so I, I hit that endpoint again, and the tripwire should go to red because it's now being unhealthy. So this is, uh, you don't have to refresh this. this. This checks every 10 seconds. You can change that, and this is uh, um, just a few lines of code to get this, message, um, this status page. And it's good for seeing all of the health endpoints work. All right. Let's move on. So um, doing the health checks and building it into a, in your application, um, you'll notice that if you only have um, .NET Core 2.2, there's only one actual health check available, just abstractions and a, um, a DB context check exists. If you're using Entity Framework and you have a DB context, this is a very easy way to say, okay, I have a gaming DB context or your, your customer context, and it uses all of the connection string information in your app settings, JSON, or how you wire it together and it will start to call it and see if it has a connection to the database through your DB context. Um, but this means that you, you can't really do much except for the, you know, you can do the delegates, the synchronous or the asynchronous one. 
um, or you need to build your own eye health check implementation. But there's um, uh, the, the people from Xabaril, uh, Beat Pulse, uh, they, they build this library. Uh, they did it before um, ASP.NET Core 2.2 had the health check implementation. They had all these health checks. And now that it's part of the .NET Core framework, they rewrote everything and they put it inside, uh, so that they wired it to be eye health check implementations. And on the, the right hand side of the slide, you see that there's quite a bunch of them. Uh, using Azure, AWS, and all these open source and uh, other types of stores, queues. So there's a whole lot that you can choose from and you can start integrating into your application. So I suggest using that as well. Um, we talked about registering multiple uh, health endpoints. Um, be aware that if you add more, that sometimes the order of registration of each of those endpoints with use health check um, actually uh, is significant. We saw that you could set some options. There's an option uh, to change the health um, reported status code. So it's usually 200 OK for healthy, uh, the same for degraded, and the 503 for uh, unhealthy. Um, but if you want something else instead of um, the degraded, for example, to count that as an error, you could return a 503 as well. Um, do you allow client-side caching for the one who calls it? Um, it will set some headers related to caching. You can change the way the responses are written. So instead of the simple healthy, unhealthy, you get the entire report as we saw. Um, and we saw the predicate for filtering, which comes in useful later on. The other thing that the team recommends is that um, if you have a health check, you actually register them as a singleton. So besides doing the add health check or add check and then doing the, the generic, you can also register each of your um, health checks with a certain lifetime. And in most cases, singleton is, um, is recommended. So you need to be aware of things that might be important there if there's concurrency issues. Um, but that's, that, that's, um, you would register them with the add singleton. This is what we saw with the, um, the, the visualization. Um, first of all, you need to get more information out of your health endpoint, so that means that you would do a um, override of the response writer, controlling the way the output is generated. Um, you need to query your endpoints, obviously, to get the data, and then you need to build a user interface. Um, the same uh, um, team that built the Beat Pulse health checks also has this health checks UI, which you can host inside of your, con uh, your application yourself. And I think that's good for development purposes, uh, but not as much for production, because if it's publicly available, people can actually see the health of your system, which is just too much information for the wrong people. Um, but you can also run it from a Docker container. And it will just take the report as it's built and put it out in this nice UI. OK. Now let, let's talk about a bit more advanced stuff um, once you start playing with this. And I'll go through some of the, uh, the things there. All right, so one of the things that you can also do when you register um, a health check, so this registers the slow dependency health check. Um, you give it a name, but you can add some additional stuff. For example, you can give it tags, which is a string array where you label it with certain tags, which allows you to do the filtering later on. So that's, that's one way during registration to add more stuff. Um, we could have a short look at this circuit breaker health check, which is um, something that I thought was um, um, a nice idea. Um, circuit breakers are one of the cloud patterns for resiliency. Um, if, you, um, if you try to access something and it fails, um, and you try it again and it fails again, if you do retry, then after a while you might think like, okay, it's been failing so many times now, Let's just flip a switch. It, it's uh, like um, in your, um, uh, your power supply in your home. It has the circuit breakers. It flips and you get immediate errors instead of having to wait for a long time. So that's, that's good, but it is also an indication that if too many of those circuit breakers actually flip open, then it might just be that your system is struggling. So could you build something um, that will uh, check its health based on the circuit breakers and in what state they're in. So the idea is that um, let's let's go back. Um, the idea is that 
for circuit breakers, you can build them yourself, but you can also use Poly as a, as a NuGet package. Uh, Poly, written like this, has uh, implementations for circuit breakers, and you can just use them. Um, and the trick of um, looping everything together um, without tying everything to your implementation, I found was uh, this was a nice one. So you create the policy where you have the details of you know, how many exceptions are allowed and how long do I break, so how do long do I flip open. Um, Poly has this notion of a registry where you can just register all of your policies and we put in this default breaker. Um, so, and you can have more, so that if there's multiple things you might access, you have multiple circuit breaker policies with each of them different details. Um, that's a registry and we register that one um, let me see, here. So we, um, we register a singleton for a read-only policy registry. So that allows us to inject anywhere in the application the policy registry, but only as a read-only uh, implementation. Um, we also have the circuit breaker health check options, which is a long name, um, but it's uh, using the services.configure. So we will read it from configuration from the section circuit breaker health check options and if we go to the app settings you can actually see that there's this section here that says you know check all of these um, uh, circuit breakers um, and you can have more than one and in the health check implementation itself what you would do is you would inject the options because we need to know the name of the poli of the, the circuit breaker policies we need to have and we need the registry to uh, extract them and then um, in the health check, it becomes, you know, it, it's your choice of implementation, where we just loop over all of the uh, names inside of the options that we configured. So that was the default breaker and the special one. Uh, we try to get a policy. So if your configuration has a name that doesn't really exist, it will just skip it. But if it's there, it will see what the state of the breaker is. And if it's isolated, so that's open, or if it's half open, that means that it's trying to get closed again, and it, but it's be, being careful there. Um, then you would say, okay, this is degraded. You return this health check result, degraded, and you can add a description. And in this case, too many circuit breakers are open. And after a minute, it will go to half open. And then after another minute, it will go to closed again, and then it's working again. So this is um, a way that you can build your own health checks, add them in, um, and the other thing, um, we see all these add singletons for the dependencies. So whenever you um, um, access one, you know that it's the same one because some of them will do state. For example, this slow dependency, which is from the ASP.NET uh, uh, core samples, it, um, it has a task that takes 15 seconds. So it, it will take a while. You need to get back the same one for the 15 seconds to actually pass, otherwise you will never get a healthy uh, return value. All right. Now, that's all grand, right? So we have an health endpoint, we have multiple, we can use it, we get back information, and now that, what do we do? Um, one thing that um, uh, you will start doing is you will start monitoring the health. That's, that's one approach. So you will have something, uh, like a tool, that will just re uh, periodically call into the health endpoint uh, or endpoints that are there at a certain frequency, so um, every minute, maybe five minutes or every 10 seconds, and we'll see, uh, is it still healthy? It can even do that from multiple locations, because if you have a large distributed system and it's geo-distributed, um, it might have different instances running all over the world. So you might want to check each of the continents, for example, to see how it's doing from a particular location, and if one region is failing, um, it says something about how the system is running there, but it might give an indication, do, do we, is there something happening? Do we need to page someone, send a, a message? Do we, does somebody need to wake up in the middle of the night? That's with the alerting part. So if you have a lot of reports of unhealthiness because you're querying your entire system, something might be up and you need to get out of bed or uh, stop your work and see what is going on. Um, there, there's also a lot of um, um, tools out there. I've, I've taken some screenshots from, from Azure Application Insights. 
Um, it has this availability facility, and all the other uh, cloud providers have something um, similar, where you can see, you know, is there a blip inside of um, our availability across multiple locations? And if something is happening there, it, it generates an alert. So, for example, if, if these, these different uh, places go down and you're checking from multiple locations, um, it will actually, you know, this is inside of the portal, but you can wire an alert to be reported to you in whichever way is needed. So it could be webhooks, could be sending you an SMS message, like something is up, um, go check. Um, as you notice, this is pretty, you know, where you only get a, a red burning light and you're notified of it, but you still need to go and investigate what is happening. And then it, it's up to you. How do you actually uh, intervene? What do you, what do countermeasures do you take? Do you check if a database is out or do you restart something? But that's all up to you. Okay, another approach. We already saw the health check publishers being registered very briefly. Um, and I mentioned that besides of asking, you can also push it out. Um, let's see how that works. So uh, publishers will, instead of being asked, they will just push out the health information periodically. When you do the add health checks, I told you that it registers the default health check service, and that's true, but it also registers an iHosted service implementation the health check publisher hosted service. Um, that's there running in the background as a hosted service, and it will, based on the options that you have, it will, on a certain interval, start pushing out information. Um, so you, you have your, um, your endpoint, but that's uh, not being used in this case. What you would do is you would add these um, uh, publishers. Um, this is also from the BeatPulse libraries, by the way. They built two. They built one for uh, Application Insights, and they built one for Prometheus. You give it enough information so that the implementation, once this publisher is asked to push something out, um, it actually knows where to push it. So you register, um, underwater it registers an eye health check publisher. If you have something else, you can implement this, this as well um, and register those into the system. If, if uh, the period is up, so the health check publisher hosted service will ask the default health check service, give me that report, so we'll give a report, and it will, um, in, in, uh, it will have a enumerable, uh, so a list of I health check publishers being pushed in, and it doesn't really care where they come from, and it starts calling the publish on each of those publishers, and they will push out the information somewhere else in a given format. Um, the Application Insights one will do something that Application Insights can accept, and Prometheus, it will have the Prometheus metrics that uh, Prometheus actually understands. This is, this is a short one. Um, this is in, um, in .NET Core 2.2, so, so you are aware of this. If you register an iHosted service before you call the um, Add Health Checks, um, there's this small bug in there that actually tries to put it in, and if uh, there's already a registered iHosted service, it will not register the publisher service. So there, this is the workaround. It will be fixed in .NET Core 3.0, but for now, um, if you don't have another iHosted service, you're totally fine, but if you have one registered before, you need to have this bit of code. I put it in the slides so you don't uh, get stuck on this uh, before you find out. Okay. Well, um, I'm, I'm much of a Microsoft guy, um, but I thought, okay, let, let's just go into something that's not Microsoft and look at Prometheus and Grafana, because that's, that's very popular um, um, outside of the Microsoft ecosystem. So we have, again, our .NET Core application. Um, it might have a, uh, um, a health endpoint or not, um, and we want to get it into Prometheus. Now, you might expect that Prometheus will call into the health endpoint, but it, it doesn't, because the health endpoint gives data in a different format, and Prometheus is all about scraping sources, and it doesn't know how to scrape our health endpoints. So that's, that's not what we're going to do. Um, instead, the health check publisher service, it has, uh, you need the, uh, the Prometheus publisher, um, and you need a push gateway. And a push gateway is uh, what Prometheus has um, um, available, it's a place where applications can push their information because some of the applications, if they need to push metrics, 
Um, they, are, they might not be around long enough before they crash or something um, to actually be queried or scraped by Prometheus itself. So instead of that, it just pushes it out itself and it's always in time because the push gateway is available. So when there's a publish, the health metrics will be published to the push gateway. And um, this is something to be aware of. Um, the health report will be converted into metrics that we discussed in the beginning. So this, this moves us into the metric space and it will just push it into the gateway. Prometheus then can just scrape the gateway as one of its uh, scrape sources and it will get all the metrics from the push gateway as they've come in from the publisher. And Grafana is your dashboard uh, implementation. It will query Prometheus with all of the metrics. Um, and it can, uh, upon inspection of the trends and the, the, the health metric, it can actually go and um, um, create alerts. And if you wanna, uh, want to have an alert be notified, there's a whole list of about 15 notification channels that you can send it to. So this is the loop that I, uh, I'm going to try to demo. Okay, we still have our application running. Um, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Um, all right, so back to how this all can work. Um, since Prometheus, Grafana, push gateways, um, I've, I've chosen to put a lot of stuff into containers. So I don't have to install something on my machine. I don't have to have something in the cloud. I'm just running everything from a container on my local machine. Um, ideally, if you get this source code, you can just press F5. And if you have Docker desktop installed, it will just spin up everything, download the appropriate images, uh, like the image for the health check UI, but it will also download down here, it will download Prometheus. It will download an image for the Prometheus push gateway. Um, you configure it with this, um, this YAML file to, to be exactly like you need it to be. So that's this config file that's up here. It takes a little bit of tweaking, but this is all the scrape config. So this is all the things that it will start scraping. So you see that it scrapes itself. It scrapes our um, uh, ASP.NET Core Web API. It scrapes the uh, push gateway and a node exporter if you're running this inside of um, a cluster where the, each of the nodes is pushing out node metrics. So not related to us, but to the, uh, to the cluster. Those things are all there in the configuration. And we have the push gateway. It runs at a certain port, 1991. 1990 is our Prometheus uh, place. And we have Grafana. Um, and Grafana runs on port 3000. And it's wired, it depends on Prometheus, and it has a connection to Prometheus with um, the port that it knows how to reach, uh, that it's actually configured inside. So let's go and see if we can make that work. So if we go to localhost, um, what did we have? We had a Prometheus, right, 1990. So we can here look for metrics. So if we go for health, you can see that our publisher, once it started pushing stuff, it has a health check. We can execute it. We can look at the graph and you can see that while we were doing the demo, this part here where it goes down and down, two is healthy, one is degraded, zero is unhealthy. So it's a very simple metric that we get from the publisher, but it works because we can actually, you know, if, if it falls below two or below one, then we could say, okay, this is an alert. We need to do something about it. Um, you could also check the, um, the health check duration because that might be an indication of how long that it takes. And then you can see, okay, we have some spikes of a couple of uh, parts of seconds, so it's not doing really slow. This, is, this looks good. But you won't be looking at Prometheus. You will be going to Grafana. So if we do uh, 3000, you will log into uh, Grafana. Um, um, I pre-configured it, I created a persistent volume so it actually remembers everything, but you could um, um, add new sources. Um, so uh, I've done that, I've looped it or connected it to Prometheus and 
I created this, um, this panel here that shows us a lot of the data. As you can see now, it's, being, uh, it's, it's healthy at the moment. Um, but we did go here from, um, um, this, this orange was when it went into the degraded state, when I called the API buggy slash one, and when I called it again, it went to zero. And later on, I called it again and went back to being healthy. So this is where, um, in this part, the red dotted line is actually, this is where the alert triggered. Um, I've hooked it up with uh, notification channels. Um, and there's a notification channel for Slack. So if you go um, here, you can configure um, a hook to your Slack channel that you want to uh, publish into and the alert will be reported by Grafana into Slack. So it, if all went well, um, see this is 125 when we did the first part of the demo. Uh, that's when it actually tripped the red uh, part with the alert uh, query. And uh, just a moment ago when I flipped it back up by calling it again, it says, okay, it's doing okay now. Now you can go all fancy with this. So if you invest more time, you can e even get those uh, graphs in that show you the health state. This is the test one, but if you push them out to a blob storage, it will actually publish pictures there that can be included into the, the reported thing here. Um, so this is where you can be alerted from the outside. You can use Grafana as your dashboard, and you can put everything to your likings into this, uh, this, this thing here. Um, so yeah. So, um, Simple, but very effective, because this is the state of one of your uh, things, uh, one of your uh, parts of the system. Um, it's not about um, configuring Grafana, but the alerts, they actually go and they say, you know, if it goes below one for a certain time interval, because we don't want to alert straight away, that would mean that um, if there's one unhealthy ping, that immediately pages would go off. You can, this is where you configure when people will be called for, uh, to stop their work or step out of bed. Okay. So um, this is watching from the outside. You get an alert and you say that something is wrong and you need to go there and you need to start doing a root cause analysis. What is actually going wrong? Um, but if you want to create a resilient application, you need to do more because uh, just knowing that, it's, that you're unhealthy is good and you didn't crash yet, Maybe you can recover yourself. Maybe you can heal yourself. Um, one of the things to do that is uh, with the resiliency cloud patterns. Um, we talked about the circuit breaker, but there's also timeout retry. There's bulkhead. There's a whole bunch of them. You can find plenty of documentation. Poly is your go-to NuGet package if you want to implement them um, in your application. You know, but there's other things. You can look at performance statistics that might also indicate um, how you're doing. Um, but for self-healing, um, when you take into account cluster orchestrators, so think Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, um, then the, um, the monitoring on your health, end, uh, health endpoints uh, might certainly take a different uh, direction because you will look at availability. And if you are a cluster coordinator and you're running all these containers and there's all these implementations, um, redundantly being hosted. And one of them says, I'm not being healthy anymore. What the cluster orchestrator does, it's pretty merciless. It will just say, I will recycle you. I will just kill you as a process and spin up a new, a new item. Um, and we're, we're, we should be good again. And I'll try to heal the system by just um, um, stopping everything that's not healthy and starting up new stuff again. So that's about readiness and liveliness. Inside of Kubernetes, um, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the way it's organized, it has the notion of pods. And pods is a, usually just one container, but it can be a container with a sidecar, a combination of containers that always will be started together. So you start pods inside of a Kubernetes, and the, 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 the orchestrator will take care of placing the pods on all of the nodes, the, the less busy nodes, and making sure that it's as safely distributed as possible. So if you have five nodes and you ask for three uh, replicas, that's the number of pods that you want to run for a particular container, it will just not put them all three in one node because if the node goes down, everything goes down and so does 
your application. So it just distributes them evenly, and that's what you can indicate. And inside the deployment file for uh, Kubernetes, which is a YAML file, you can instruct all of the, um, all of the parts with the replicas, and um, um, for each of the parts, you can say, okay, this is how you will probe my readiness. Readiness means I'm okay to start receiving incoming traffic because the cluster coordinator can route the traffic, the incoming HTTP requests, for example, to your pod. And if you're saying, I'm not ready yet, it will hold off the traffic. If you're saying, I'm ready, just bring it on, it will start using um, or start routing all the traffic to your pod. The liveliness, on the other hand, um, is if you're being uh, healthy and if you should stay uh, running or if you should be recycled. So those two, and I've put in the slash ready and the slash lively, usually you take uh, additional endpoints to um, make sure that, you're, um, um, that you can distinguish between the two. You don't have to do all the health checks for ready and you don't have to do all the health checks for lively. Um, to start implementing that, um, um, we talked about the tags, so you might put in tags that say, okay, this is a health check that should be filtered for ready, we're, because uh, during ready, we want to run this one. For lively, we want to run it, uh, we run everything or nothing, um, just an indication. So uh, at the bottom, you see, okay, you do the um, use health checks, you say the slash ready as an additional endpoint, and your predicate will say only a registration with a tag that contains ready. Um, then you have the lively, and there you could just say, just any check that is registered, we should do to make sure if we're still lively. Um, remember, the, the way you uh, order these registration of use health checks might matter, so make sure you put them in the right order. Now, during the um, um, deployment of um, um, a, a replica set into your cluster, you um, can work with this, this way, your, your uh, cluster orchestrator will keep your system healthy. So if, um, if you have three of them, um, because your uh, replica s says three, so you get three pods on various nodes. And if one goes down because it crashes, um, the coordinator will, um, will spin up a new one and will always try to keep up to three. That, that's what you get from the readiness and the health, uh, healthiness, um, the liveliness as well. But on an upgrade, what would you do? So in an upgrade, you can do rolling updates. This will give you zero downtime deployment if you don't do it right. Um, so for a rolling update, you specify how much extra pods it can spin up and how much of the nodes, uh, the pods, can be unavailable. So we start with three, the zero says Never can there be anyone unavailable of those three. So you need to add more, but no more than two. So we go up to five while we flush in a new version of the pod because there's a new container. That's the deployment scenario. And it goes to something a little bit like this. So you put in a new pod, V2, the new version. It has a new image. So we will pull the new image and it will start checking if it's lively and if it's ready. Um, at the moment, it's degraded because during the startup, um, the readiness uh, endpoint might say, I'm not ready yet. So it, it's there, but it, it cannot take down one of the V1 pods just yet. So um, it goes up to two because it will spin up a new one. And then it starts waiting to see, are you ready? Are you lively? Are you ready? Are you lively? And it will do so in a certain interval. But then all of a sudden, one of them says, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm ready to go. So another one needs to make way, the V1 goes away. Um, but we still need to replace one more, so a new one comes in as well. And this is repeated until we're done. So this will go green, so the two go there, the V1s can disappear, and we're back to um, having a new version there without the previous version being unavailable. And if the new one is somehow faulty and it never becomes healthy, the V1s don't go away. So they will be reachable and you have zero downtime. And once this is uh, migrated, you see that it flips over to the new version. So the original parts are only taken offline after a new one is available. And this also, except for, uh, so not only zero downtime deployments, it will also allow you to do roll forward updates. 
Because if it doesn't work, you don't say, oh, we need to roll it back to the previous version because it's still there. You can just deploy a newer version and see what happens. And, and if that one is, is good, then it will start replacing and you're uh, good to go again. Okay. So let's see if that works the, in a demo. So what I have, I have running on my machine Docker desktop and it has an internally hosted single node uh, cluster which is called Docker for desktop. It's, it's like Minikube, but this comes with an installation of Docker desktop. I've also created a um, deployment file for um, Kubernetes. And this is where it says, okay, I have a service, which is a published pod, it will get an endpoint. Um, and it uses, um, let me see, down here, we say, okay, uh, we have this image here, Retro Gaming Web API Latest, which is our project. Um, we have the, the strategy for the rolling update here with a max search of two and the available uh, of zero. Um, and here we have the readiness probe, which says, do this endpoint on this port, and these parameters that are here, uh, initially wait five seconds, do it every 10 seconds, don't do it longer than 20 seconds, and after five times, you can consider it that it's not uh, gonna work, that we're not gonna get ready. Um, the liveliness is somewhat similar, but you might change your, wa um, your waiting times, and this needs to be tweaked in order for this to work. Um, so this is one part, and with a connection to your, um, um, your, your cluster, um, it would be e relatively easy to start deploying. If, we, if I press enter in this dialog, I do a kube control apply, which is applying that file to the cluster. But first, let's see if we can have a look at the cluster. Um, I did a kube control proxy, and if it's still alive, we should be able to see the cluster here. It's a very long URL. So I'll just say, open the link from this one. Okay, let's go to the right namespace. There we go. And we see that we have a, it, it looks good, right? We have three out of three running, three pods are available. And now let's see what happens if we apply this. So, I need to refresh this a lot. And if all goes well, and we're not getting a reply now. Let's see if we can get this to work. Sometimes this is an indication that the proxy died, so let's do that again. Mm, this is unfortunate. Um, what we would like to have seen is that it actually spins up additional things, um, unable to handle the requests. Okay, this is not gonna work. So what you would see is that the, the, the green one goes red for a bit and it waits there and it will start replacing each of the nodes uh, or the pods in, in turn. Uh, let's not waste time there because there's a few more things that I would like to cover in the last minute. Um, for securing your, um, your health endpoints because you don't want everyone to query it. First of all, um, um, expose as little as possible. That's a security best practice. And you can, can use different ports because inside of your cluster or your implementation, if you're, uh, you're running, you can uh, exclude um, health endpoints from being exposed if you put them on a different port. It would be very easy to shield it from that. And exposing things inside of your cluster, for example, under a port like 8080, um, doesn't, it automatically means that it can't be reached from the outside unless you create a load balancer rule to your uh, health endpoints but the cluster only needs to look inside itself to see all of the running pods. Um, you can also add some uh, authentication uh, with uh, middleware, so you can just do a use when, when you register the routes um, and, uh, or the, the middleware pipeline and just say, okay, if you're authenticated, you can actually access the health check endpoint. Um, 
and you can publish instead of exposing an endpoint, which is what we discussed with the Prometheus and Grafana. It pushes out, so it doesn't need to expose anything. Most of these we've already uh, discussed. Um, uh, assume the worst case when you're doing stuff. Make sure you set your timeouts uh, very short. Um, don't go overboard with very complicated health checks because if they take too long, it might actually burden your system with all the health checking that they're doing. And um, one of the tips is you register them as singleton, which also allows you to have state and all. Um, so in summary, um, we started with an application. We added the uh, health check endpoints with all the health checks internally. And we enabled outside tooling to start asking for health information. We looked at publishing it to push it out into something like Prometheus or Application Insights or some other tool that can accept metrics with your health info. We looked a bit at uh, how it can run inside of a container. And unfortunately, the, um, the, the, the Kubernetes cluster didn't show what it was doing. But Kubernetes can manage your pods and your containers very well by inspecting the health endpoints with readiness and liveliness. That is it, we're out of time, one minute over, apologies. Um, I will be here, I'll take any questions um, after the session um, at the discussion zone, so if you have some questions, feel free to join me there. And thanks very much, have a lovely rest of the conference. <laughs>